Right, good afternoon. Uh, so I'm Paul Schwarzenberger, um, and uh, I work uh, as a cloud security engineer for Ovo Energy. Ovo Energy is um, one of the uh, largest um, energy providers in the UK. Um, and about two years ago, we started a bug bounty program. And uh, as you'll hear, um, one of the issues which came out of that was um, subdomain takeover. So that led to uh, the creation of a brand new OWASP project uh, called Domain Protect. So that's what I'm going to uh, tell you about and show you. So I'm going to start off just by, uh, for, th for those of you who are um, yeah, perhaps some of you I know are very experienced in this already and have had this problem at your organization and know all about it. Uh, there may be one or two of you who um, you know, are a bit less uh, knowledgeable about this. So I'm just going to go over what subdomains are and what subdomain takeover is first um, and then move on to you know, how we can actually prevent it. So, so let's suppose I've got this amazing idea for a, a new business. Um, and I'm sure it's going to be successful. Um, it's going to be really good. And I think, and how am I going to start? I'm going to start with a domain name. So I'm going to register a domain name. And oh, I know I'm going to call it fantasticfood.biz. So, you know, I'm onto a surefire winner. This is really going to be big. Um, and then, uh, so I produce a website and an online sort of store. And, you know, after a month, I've got maybe two customers or something. And so I think, all right. So what I need to do, I need to, um, I know what I'll do. I'll create a blog. So I'm going to create a blog and um, I find this site called freeblogs.com. So I'm going to go to freeblogs.com. I go there and um, you know, it, after about an hour, I've created what looks like quite a nice blog. And um, they let me choose a name. So I choose a name. So I'm going to choose Fantastic Food. So now I have a blog and the blog is called the, the blog website uh, address or the fully qualified domain name. Uh, is fantasticfood.freeblogs.com. But then I think to myself, well, that's not a very good name because I don't want my customers to see freeblogs.com. I want everything to be branded by amazing, you know, new name that I've just bought for £10 or whatever. Um, so I want to call that something dot fantasticfood.biz. So uh, I then create a um, subdomain called blog dot freefood.biz and in my DNS records and they could be anywhere I mean they could be in they could be hosted by the people that I've registered the domain with like fast hosts or GoDaddy or or it could be in a cloud provider like AWS or GCP um, or Azure there's lots of places you can register you know have 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 domain records but anyway wherever it is I then create a domain name record uh, a subdomain record for blog and uh, the, you can choose different types. So the type I'm going to choose um, is uh, a C name. So C name is canonical name, stands for canonical name. So now I've got my new uh, amazing uh, blog called blog.fantasticfood.biz and it points to fantasticfood.freeblogs.com. So now when uh, all of my two customers uh, try and access this, or hopefully maybe a bit more. You know, they use their web browser, so it resolves DNS, um, and then their uh, web browser um, goes to the, the blog, and in their web browser they just see blog.fantasticfood.biz, but under the hood, under the scenes, um, uh, the, uh, is actually really going to fantasticfood.freeblogs.com. But that never gets seen by the user unless you do a lot of technical investigation. It's not obvious in the, in the web browser. So that's, you know, a typical subdomain. But then after a month, um, you know, I've now gone from maybe two customers to three customers. So, you know, my business isn't doing very well. Um, and I think, well, I can't really afford this. Well, then I find that free blogs is actually not a free blog at all. It was just free for a month and it was a free trial. So, you know, I got, got done a bit there. So, um, so what I'm, so what, so then what I'm going to do is I think, well, I can't really afford that, afford to pay what they want to pay. So I'm going to actually just delete that account. And I don't know if anybody was reading that blog anyway. So now I've removed that account. But now I sort of forget that 
I've created that DNS record because that was a month or two ago. Whoops. But that leaves us in a bit of a difficult situation because an attacker, a malicious attacker or bug bounty researcher can then, um, they can become a customer of free blogs on a free trial themselves. And depending on how free blogs, if they do any checks or not, um, they can then set up their own uh, blog and they can choose the same name that I used to have. And then they've actually got a, their own website that um, blog.fantasticfood.biz points to. And then they could use it to do all sorts of nasty things. So they could um, have uh, offensive content, which ruins the reputation of my company with three customers. Um, uh, you know, they could host malicious content that ends up on my customers' laptops. Or they could set up a very convincing login page for people to put in their credentials and then harvest those and then use those for malicious purposes or sell them on the dark web. So lots of bad things they could do with this. Um, and this is a quite a um, significant problem for a lot of organizations. So of those of you here, how many have organizations have you been aware of or have worked with that have had some issues like this? Okay. <laughs> so about about some of the hands were a little hesitant. I mean, it's, don't worry, we've all had, well, not all, but, you know, most organizations have had this issue, so you're not alone. Um, and about half of you raised your hands, and probably the other half really have got some issues, but either didn't want to raise your hands or didn't know about them. Um, so, and that's fine. <laughs> so, um, so it is a real, it is a real issue. Um, so what we'll do now, um, is we're going to, deliberately create some um, dangling DNS records. So this is known, when, when it's not being used, it's known, some people refer to it as a dangling DNS entry, and that's a domain which is, a subdomain which is then uh, potentially vulnerable to take over. So we're gonna just create some deliberately. Um, so, um, right, so we're gonna start, so, as I mentioned, there's lots of different places you can host your DNS records. Um, but a very common place uh, that to host it is in a cloud provider, um, pr pr provider's DNS service. Um, so I'm going to begin by using AWS uh, Amazon Web Services. So how many of you have a, an account or work for a, a customer that, has a, that uses AWS or an employer that uses AWS? So probably about half the people in the room. So uh, this will be familiar to some of you. So I'm going to, um, yeah, so, so, so in my, um, AWS account, um, I have, I've created a few websites. So I'm going to show you a few websites that I've just created. Um, and, uh, so first of all, uh, a simple way to create a website, if it's just static content, a simple way to create a website is to use, um, uh, uh, to use a storage account or S3, simple storage service. So um, that's just somewhere um, that within AWS, you can just upload a file. So I've got various S3 buckets here. And there's one here, which is called yosemite.selidor.io. Uh, so my company, I have my own personal company called Selidor, and uh, hence, hence that name. And then one of the domains that I've registered is Selidor.io. And anyway, I've created this S3 bucket here. And it's a very simple S3 bucket, and it has a picture of Yosemite. So the theme today is national parks. So we're doing national parks. So Yosemite, as most of you probably know, is a very famous and beautiful uh, national park in the United States. So um, so I've created, a, uh, created that, and I've given that the name Yosemite.Selidor.io. And so now if I, uh, so, so to get that to, uh, because what I want to do is to have a subdomain of my, uh, my, uh, the domain that I registered, Selidor.io, and I want a subdomain called Yosemite.Selidor.io that points to this national park. So, um, so I have, have that. So let's just sort of, uh, let's have a look at see if that, how that has been set up. And this is quite a common pattern that developers you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes use anyway, and it shows the, the principle. So, uh, yes, yeah, so if I go into, um, another different AWS service, which is Route 53. So Route 53 is 
the name of the AWS service that is used for everything to do with DNS. And it's called Route 53, I presume, because 53 is the uh, TCP and UDP port used for the domain name service. And also, uh, I presume that Route 53 or Route 53 for these Americans in the room, <laughs> there's at least one, um, uh, you know, is similar to Route 66 and, and so on. So um, anyway, so I've, um, so I, as I mentioned, so I, I you could use Route 53 for, uh, uh, a couple of different purposes. You can use it to register domains. So I have actually used it to register a domain. Um, you don't have to. Um, you can register a domain, obviously, wherever you want. And um, whether you've registered it in Route 53 or not, you can then uh, create a hosted zone. So hosted zone is just the list, the domain name records for a particular domain. So I've um, got that here. And uh, I've then created a... Uh, a record for Yosemite.cellular.io that hopefully should point to that bucket. Um, and I should have tested this before, <laughs> before, uh, well, I have tested it a while back. I haven't actually tested it today. Um, but if that uh, reference all works and is all correct, um, then l let's see if that works. Um, right. Okay, so I'm just going to type in here uh, Yosemite.cellular.io. And yes, that has worked. So, so that's great. So that's worked. Now, okay, so, so I've now got, that's one of my websites. So now what I'm going to do is, um, I think I'll create another website for another national park. So because we're in Ireland, uh, there's a very beautiful national park in Ireland called Killarney National Park, which I have had the uh, privilege of going to um, quite a few years ago and uh, in and it didn't rain when I was there. It was very, very nice. So um, so how would, I, how would I do that from a DNS point of view? So I think I've got, I'll have, I'd have to create a DNS record and have to create an S3 bucket. So for now, I'm just going to create the DNS record. Um, right. So, um, so what I'm going to do is just pick up this as the format that I need to use. And then I'm just going to create a new DNS record. Um, and I'll call this Kalani. So kilani.cellular.io for my subdomain. I'm going to make this a C name or canonical name. And I'm going to uh, point it to the S3 bucket, which I haven't actually created yet, but um, I'm going to create that. Uh, well, I'm going to point it to that. So, um, okay, so now I have a record pointing to uh, my the S3 bucket. Uh, but it's time for me to go home now, so um, I'll do the bucket tomorrow, you know. So... So we'll just leave that for now. Um, and uh, okay, so then also my account, I've got a few other resources that I've built. Um, so uh, another one, so of course, it, you don't have to host, um, there might be uh, websites on uh, web applications on S3 buckets. Uh, you know, if they're dynamic, you might want to host them on an EC2 instance. So um, uh, yeah, so, uh, so I've also done that. So, so I've got another one which uh, another record, another um, website, which is here. So this is a, an EC2 instance, and it's running Apache. And on the Apache um, web server, I've put a, an image. And um, then this, uh, this instance has a, so this is a virtual machine. And the instance has a public IP address, uh, which is that. And then um, what I've done then is in my uh, Route 53 somewhere, I should have a record that points to that address. Um, yeah, and here it is. So let's see if that one works. Um, okay, so here's, here's that. So this is Fjordland is a... Very well. It looks a very uh, beautiful national park. Has anybody been there? I haven't had the privilege of being there. It's in New Zealand, but uh, being there, but it does look very nice. <laughs> I'd like to go there. Um, so, anyways, for Fjordland uh, National Park. Um, so that's uh, so that's pointing to that EC2 instance. That's um, uh, an A record. If we just have another look at that Route 53, um, Route 53. Yeah, we've got Fjordland, and that's an A record. So that's pointing to an IP version four address there. But um, what I'm actually thinking, now that I come to think of it, 
is um, this is a bit expensive to have a, an EC2 instance running all the time, running this website. Um, so I think maybe I'll convert it to an S3 bucket sometime. But for now, I need to save some money. So um, so uh, I'm going to just turn that off because this is too expensive. Uh, so I'm going to just terminate that instance. Um, and then I've got another uh, another record, uh, another website I've set up. So there's another service in um, AWS called Elastic Beanstalk. So Elastic Beanstalk is a uh, it's a sort of application service. Um, I mean, anybody who uses say Google Cloud would be like App Engine or uh, Azure. Azure would be um, App Service. So you just sort of upload some code and and then. It just deploys all that underneath the hood, and you don't have to worry about it. So, um, so I, I set up one of those as well. Um, uh, so uh, let's just have a look at that. So if we just open up another new tab, go to um, Elastic Beanstalk. I've got this environment here, um, and uh, in this case, so this is this Elastic Beanstalk instance. So under the hood, it does create some instances and. Uh, low balances and things like that. Um, and then this record I've actually put into Cloudflare. So I've got a record in Cloudflare and I've called this Corcov Corcovado. So anybody been to Corcovado? Oh, am I, am I pronouncing it right firstly? Oh, that was good. <laughs> I wasn't sure. It's in, it's in, it's in, um, Costa, Costa Rica, isn't it? I think Costa Rica. So let's have a look at what that looks like. So we've got, uh, Corcovado, uh, so Corcovado, uh, and National Park. Um, ah, well, that's interesting. So the, the nice thing about, um, the, what, the nice thing about demos is sometimes they don't work. <laughs> so, um, so in this case, um, this has already been taken over. So I must have made some mistake there. Oh, no, I know what it is. I know. Hold on. Let me just, sorry. I need to do a refresh. This is from a previous demo. So the demo did work, but I didn't, um, clear the cache. So this is what will hopefully work later. Maybe we'll see. This is Corcovado National Park. And is it as beautiful as that? Yeah, I'm so jealous. I'd love to go. <laughs> uh, it does look amazing. Right. Anyway, so that's on an Elastic Beanstalk, um, uh, environment. Elastic Beanstalk environments are also very expensive. So this would be a very expensive way of running, um, uh, a website that just has a nice picture on it. So, um, I think we're going to, do, to get rid of that as well. So the, um, so with, uh, the, the, the DNS record is a, an, a, a, um, by the way, is a C name record, um, uh, that, that's, that's pointed to that Elastic Beanstalk instance. Um, but anyway, uh, as I say, I've got to just cut down the cost of this bill on my AWS account. So I'm just going to delete that as well. Right. So, um, that is, uh, now I've got to just confirm that. Hold on. Um, I can do that. Okay, so I've now terminated that. So I've saved lots of money now. I've got rid of the Elastic Beanstalk environment. I've got rid of the um, EC2 instance. Um, and I'm going to... To, I'm going to, I'm going to also, um, get to create an S3 bucket so that I've got the Killarney National Park and then I'll be all set. But I'm going to do all that tomorrow. I'm not going to do it today because I'm busy. Right. So, uh, let's just now return to the presentation. Done enough of that. Okay. So, um, so you can see what I've done. Um, that we've now got several different deliberately dangling DNS entries. Um, that could potentially cause trouble <laughs> because I've done various things. And these are all things which, um, unfortunately, a lot of developers do. Um, and it's not to put down developers. Often the situ often the systems aren't in place to, uh, so that the developers necessarily understand the importance of what, of why they need to d delete the DNS entries. Um, or sometimes, unfortunately, there's not a single infrastructure as code, code base that deploys both the resource and the DNS entry at the same time. So there's some of the sort of issues. So this is what I've just done is they're all things that happen. Well, in my experience, they, they, they happen. Um, quite often, unfortunately. Um, oh, and there's one that I forgot to do. So I better do the, better do the last one. Um, 
yeah, and there's one more type um, as well. So sometimes what you want to do is to um, delegate a whole subdomain, uh, uh, delegate a subdomain to another hosted zone. So this is quite common. If say you want to have a development environment and you want uh, a separate um, team to look after that development environment, for example. So what you might want to do is to to then create a separate hosted zone. So if I go to hosted zones, um, I've created a subdomain, a, a, a delegated subdomain, sub, subdomain hosted zone, as it were. So in this case, I've got a, um, my parent domain is cellador.io, and then my subdomain hosted zone is a serengeti.cellador.io, sticking on the national park theme. Um, uh, and then, uh, so, so when I set serengeti.celador.io up in route 53, um, AWS um, allocates four name servers, um, at pretty much at random. Um, and then um, to make that actually work, I then need to uh, authorize that by delegating to that. And the way that I do that is then to in the, go to the parent domain, and then in the parent domain, create a record for uh, Serengeti, uh, which then points to those four name servers. So that's how that works. Um, anyway, uh, these hosted zones cost money as well. Um, so I'm going to delete that um, that, and that, that, that uh, hosted zone. Uh, just making sure I delete the right one. <laughs> Otherwise, I will be in trouble. Uh, right, so deleting that one. That subdomain. Okay, so I've deleted that hosted zone as well. Yeah, so that's uh, that's a whole that's a hosted zone uh, subdomain uh, deleted. So yeah, now I will go back to the presentation and stay there for a little while. Right. Um, so about um, nearly two years ago, uh, at Ovo Energy, we began a bug bounty program. So how many of you have worked with companies that have bug bug bounty programs? So, okay, quite a lot. I mean, I would, but over half, about half. So I'm not sure what your experiences are, but in my experience, um, they are very beneficial um, and uh, um, have, in our case, they identified a whole load of not have become aware of without having done, you know, opened up the bug bounty program. Uh, it's not to say they're an answer for everything, um, but um, they, they are extremely, uh, we've found them to be extremely useful. Um, and they've helped us discover things that, you know, we didn't even know about in the organization, um, which was great, you know. So um, we started off uh, quite um, slowly just with one domain um, because you can have a scope. So we had a, quite a small scope to start off with, as you might expect. Um, and then we gradually increased and then we had a big, big jump when we... we um, uh, ex expanded the scope to include all the major brands in the comp in the company, um, and then since then um, things have come down a bit um, uh, and, and have reached a more of a sort of steady state, and, and that's largely because of the tool that I'm going to talk talk about. Uh, so, um, so what we found was that in the first uh, six three to six months of the program, um, roughly fifty percent of the uh, findings and also about 50% of the uh, payouts were all to all subdomain takeovers. Um, and so we got, we, we just got fed up of these subdomain takeovers. So, um, uh, so what we, you know, so, so what we decided is we really needed to do something about it. Um, and, uh, we had a look, uh, around at what, what was available, uh, that, that we could use. Um, and we didn't, we didn't really find anything that we were particularly happy with. I mean, there are, there's some paid services there, um, uh, that are available. Uh, there's also, there was some open source tools, but what we found for, on the open source side that was that they were nearly all from a, a sort of, there were tools to help a bug bounty researcher find, um, subdomains or, or take over subdomains. Um, we didn't really find anything that was sort of on the more defensive side. Um, and and what we what what we sort of felt was, you know, we we know where so so in our particular case, um, nearly all our records are on AWS in Route 53. Um, some of them are in Cloudflare. Um, so we sort of knew we you know within the company we had information on all the domains. So we sort of thought, well, what we ought to be able to do is just, you know, 
go around all the all the um route 53 records uh of all the different accounts in the org and you know then test whether something's vulnerable or not so we ought to be able to you know it didn't seem like a unsolvable problem so um so we decided to create our own um and uh when we originally created it we uh created it as a private project um then we open sourced it within ovo and then we decided uh that um we wanted to make this you know more widely known within the community and available to um anybody because the 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 um, issues that we faced within Ovo are not in no way unique at all. You know, they're, they're common issues and the tech stack that we use is quite, you know, it's not that and not unusual either. So, uh, you know, we wanted other people to benefit and, um, uh, hopefully contribute. So, um, so Ovo, uh, agreed to transfer this to OWASP, um, sort of ownership. Um, uh, these are the, uh, the repos. Um, that are currently in, in, within the scope of OWASP domain protect. Uh, so the, the top one is the, the main one, which, um, uh, it applies, uh, is used for records in AWS and Cloudflare. Um, the, then we have one that's, uh, for GCP. Um, we've got a couple of, um, deployment, uh, repos that make it very easy to deploy with GitHub actions. And, um, the last one, is uh something i just did very recently which is actually the terraform to produce the demo which i've just given you today <laughs> so uh so that's the last one um uh, right so um so they're the the uh the repos um so what actually is a wasp domain protect well its purpose is to uh prevent subdomain takeover so um the what we and, and bearing in mind that um uh, as i mentioned uh, most of our records are held within uh, Route 53 in AWS. So, um, and, and like most uh, organizations that use AWS, uh, it, it's good when you start off working with AWS, if you just, you do it, you know, create your own AWS account, you just have one account. Um, and then uh, when, if you're working for a bigger organization, uh, it's good practice to split out um, different accounts for different purposes least privilege, um, you know, have different accounts for different teams, different accounts for different environments, development, staging, and prod. And before you know it, you can have hundreds, if not thousands of accounts in a larger organization. So, um, so we have a few hundred. Um, and also AWS has a lot of good practice about, um, how to, uh, sort of architect that pattern of multiple accounts. And one of the, their recommendations is that you have a, a uh, dedicated security tooling account. And that's where domain protect should, should go. So, uh, domain protect, um, we, we started off doing a few sort of scripts just to sort of see, you know, what can we actually discover by running some scripts? Um, but then we realized, okay, we, we could use some scripts, but that's only ever going to be a point in time solution. And it's quite complicated to run the scripts. Um, and, you know, new vulnerabilities are popping up all the time. So we need a more, uh, continuous compliance, uh, type of solution. Um, and then from a tech point of view, we didn't want this to be expensive to run, um, or, uh, have a high operational overhead or anything like that. We wanted it to be to just keep running and you can almost forget about it. Um, and so we went for a completely sort of serverless, um, architectures and serverless approach. So, um, uh, so the, so how many of you are sort of familiar with the concept of serverless? So probably about half or so, two thirds. So yeah, so I mean, the idea of th these various serverless, um, sort of services that AWS and the other cloud providers, um, offer are that you, you know, you don't run a virtual machine with a whole load of code. You don't have to, op um, keep operating systems up to date. You just upload some code and it just runs when you want it to run. Um, in this case, as event-driven functions using Lambda, which is AWS's service for um, event-driven functions. So, um, so we set this all up in the security account. So we start off with a Lambda function um, that it's, um, and I should also say that with with serverless um, and with Lambda functions, it is uh, the usual practice and, and good practice to split up the functions so that they're um, quite discrete, 
they each have their own uh, sort of uh, purpose and um, uh, run for a short duration and they um, uh, yeah and, and that uh, they're they, they all have to be completely stateless because there's nowhere to store anything on a lambda function. So um, anything stored has to be, or any output has to be somewhere else, like a database or a queue or a, a notification service. So anyway, we start with the lambda function um, whose only purpose is to assume a role into the organization management account. And that's the top level account within the whole org. Um, uh, and it's used to centralize the billing and centralize, um, you know, policies and, and, uh, um, and management. So you, so the first thing the Lambda function does is it assumes a role into, uh, well, the only thing that one does is assume a role into the org, uh, management account and then get a list of all the accounts in the org. Um, so it does that. And then, um, it triggers a step function. So a step function is a way of orchestrating um, serverless functions uh, within AWS. So that's their their way of, of orchestrating orchestrating uh, other serverless services. Um, we then trigger a Lambda function for every AWS account. So this could be several hundreds or even thousands of Lambda functions, depending how big your org is. And then each of those Lambda functions uh, assumes a role into the target account. And it then queries route 53, looks at all the records, and then for different types of records, it looks, does things to check, you know, is it a vulnerable record or not? Um, and uh, then if it does find something it thinks is vulnerable, uh, then it writes a record to a database. So the, we, the database we use is DynamoDB, so we chose that because that is also sort of referred to as a serverless database. You don't need a, um, a, you know, a network or anything like that. Um, it's just uh, a service offered by AWS. Um, and uh, then we write to an SNS or simple notification service uh, topic. Um, and we have another Lambda function uh, that subscribes to that topic. And that Lambda function then sends a message to Slack. And you can also subscribe to that SNS topic uh, if you want an email notification. So that's basically the architecture. Um, and then you get alerts by Slack or email. So. Here's an example alert. So this is a new vulnerable subdomain and it's identified an issue. Uh, so it tells you what account that, that that's in, what the, the DNS name is, the fully qualified domain name. Um, and in this case, you might see there's also a, a little uh, bug crowd symbol. So the um, bug bounty uh, pr uh, platform that we use at OVO is bug crowd. Uh, Another of a very well-known bug bounty program is HackerOne, which we now support as well. Um, so in this case, we're actually writing an issue to the bug bounty program, uh, and I'll come on to why we do that in a moment. Um, and we also get alerts when something is fixed. So uh, we get that as well. And then we get various other alerts uh, on more on a reporting basis. So once a day, by default, all these are... Um, values are um, can be varied. Um, it's, everything is deployed using Terraform, um, and uh, you can just change Terraform variables to change any of these values. So, um, yeah. So, so once a day, you get a report on all the domains that are still vulnerable. Hopefully, none. But if there are any, then you do get a report and some monthly stats of what's been found over the last month, year, and all time. Um, there's also, for any of you who just want to sort of try this out, but don't want to actually install anything um, in your organization, there are some, you can, there are some manual scans that you can run as well, um, uh, just from your laptop. So you can do that. They're not as comprehensive um, as the automated ones. Um, there's some things you can't do, uh, some types of vulnerability that it won't check. And also it's just, in the case of AWS, it's just for one uh, account at a time, so it is a bit more cumbersome, but it, it, it it's probably it might be worth running just to see if you find anything basically. Um, we have uh, d developed a um, simple way of deploying using GitHub Actions. So if you do want to deploy, I mean, obviously you don't have to. It might be that you've chosen some other CI/CD tool in your environment, 
and, and it's all this Terraform, so you could deploy it from anything. But we have developed um, uh, a separate repo that you could use that's only purpose is to deploy with GitHub Actions. So it's that would probably save you a lot of time, not only to deploy in the first place, but also to update because once that's in place, if you want to upgrade to the latest version of Domain Protect, then you just run the action again, and then it just will automatically get the latest version. So it's very straightforward to upgrade. Um, and uh, that is um, at that site there. Uh, it was interesting. I, I went to talk earlier on GitHub Actions um, uh, issues and vul vulnerabilities. So I was thinking, uh, <laughs> I think it's all right. <laughs> anyway, th this you'd make this private. So typically, you'd, you'd make this. Although I've made it a public repo, so that you can um, you can you know obviously download it. Um, and you know, if, if you're doing it for your org, you you make a copy of that repo um, and then make that a private repo. Uh, so that does that helps a lot <laughs> with security. Or private or internal, I should say, with GitHub. Um, okay, so the I think you were asking earlier what, what supported vulnerability types are there. So we support um, DNS records, uh, currently support DNS records in AWS Route 53, in Cloudflare, and in uh, Google uh, Cloud Platform, Cloud DNS. And we support um, vulnerability types in... Uh, uh, all of all environments, uh, in, including um, AWS registered domains, uh, subdomain delegation for name N NS records, um, alias and C name for Elastic Beanstalk and S3, um, alias and C name for CloudFront distributions with a missing S3 origin, uh, various Azure and Google uh, resources. Um, and A records uh, checks for AWS um, different types of IP addresses that AWS uses, like EC2, um, Elastic IPs, um, yeah, also ECS, uh, Elastic Container Service IPs, and global accelerator addresses. So different. So all of the we've tended to focus on what we've focused on so far is things that we know can actually be taken over because bug bounty researchers have taken them over. We, we haven't just gone for anything that we think might be bad in this hygiene. So it's not, this isn't going to, the aim of this is not to detect, not, it's not really to detect sort of messy DNS hygiene. It's more to detect things that could actually be taken over. Um, so, so that's, that's the emphasis. So, um, the, so we, so we did this. And then after about three, mo three months, um, we ran into a few issues because to start off with, uh, we were just running domain protect once a day. So these Lambda functions were just scheduled to run once a day. And then we had a manual approach of informing teams. So we in the security group would then, you know, we'd, we'd get some alerts. We'd then find out, work out what team was responsible. And then we'd go to that team and say, look, you need to fix it. And then they'd probably take two or three days and then they, they, then it would be fixed. Um, but that ends up not, well, we ended up still paying out money to branded researchers uh, because they would tend to, a lot of them have really good automation. Or, uh, any, how, how many of you actually do bug bounty research? Okay, great. So I, I know different bug bounty researchers have different approaches and some have a more sort of manual approach and, you know, will investigate. Others will have automated tooling. Um, but there's certainly some with very good automated tooling. Not to say that's the better approach. It's just you're, they're going to find different types of issues. But um, uh, there, was, there are some out there with good automated tooling that works quite quickly. <laughs> so, you know, running something once a day um, is, is not good enough because, um, I mean, as I'm sure you, you will do, you know, what, what um, you, you can find out uh, information on... Uh, so, so as a bug bounty researcher, you don't have access to Route 53, so you can't just see what the domains are. So you have to discover them all, and you can discover them through things like certificate transparency records and all sorts of different data sources and enumerate and guests and f feed them in from different programs that do all this, script all this for you. So 
but people are, you know, so bug bounty researchers are very quick at finding new issues. Um, and so we, we, anyway, we found that quite often, um, by the time, well, in some cases, they'd taken it over before we even had detected it. And in other cases, we had detected it, but the team, by the time the team fixed it, it had already been taken over, you know. So, so we, we didn't, we didn't realize we needed a new approach. Um, so we then introduced automated takeover ourselves. So the concept here is that, um, well, why don't we thought, well, why don't we do like a friendly takeover, as it were? Because if we take it over ourselves, um, then a bug bounty researcher or attacker can't take it over because we've already used up that, you know, that resource, like the S3 bucket name or that Elastic Beanstalk instance name or whatever it might be. So, um, yeah, so, uh, so, so that's, that's what we did then. And, um, we, when we, um, create those, uh, do that take of ourselves, we don't do it in the production account of that app. We do it within the security tooling account. So that's where, you know, where they get created. Um, so it's not too disruptive. It's also optional. So quite a few, um, organizations who choose to use OWASP domain protect, um, do so, um, uh, um, you know, don't ch choose that to be turned off to start with because they may be a bit nervous about it. And then when they're a bit more confident, then they turn it on. Um, so that supports Elastic Beanstalk environments and S3 buckets. Um, so, uh, okay. Um, so yeah, so what were the results? So in the first year, uh, these were the re results. So we had around 200 vulnerable subdomains altogether. Um, that we knew about. <laughs> no, well, we had, yeah, we had 200 sub vulnerable subdomains and, um, they were identified. And about half of those were, uh, detected with, um, domain protect the, for AWS and, and Cloudflare, about a quarter by the GCP version of domain protect. And then the others were a mix of some manual scans we did really before we started the, before, before we, we actually had developed domain protect. Um, and then, uh, around an eighth were, were the various bug bounty researcher, um, findings. So, so, that, so we, we, you know, we, for us, it was very successful and, and very worthwhile. Um, okay. So, uh, yeah, I'll just talk about some of the recent features that we've added. So we added, um, hacker one integration recently. Um, that was through a suggestion of Mark Curphy, um, the, uh, board member, uh, at, at an OWASP conference. He kindly introduced us to HackerOne, who then, um, helpfully set up, set us up with an account that we could use to integrate with. So it now integrates with HackerOne. Um, Google Cloud Platform, uh, as you probably know, Google Cloud Platform, they, they keep updating things a lot, uh, <laughs> which is a good thing, I suppose. But anyway, so we upgraded to a new version of that. Uh, pre-commit hooks, um, uh, collaborator recently, uh, did that, which is great, um, improved the developer experience and, uh, Slack apps as well as legacy webhooks. So there's some of the recent features. Okay. So let's have a look at, at, at some of this in action. So, um, so I want to see whether, uh, what happened as a result of all of those things I built earlier. Um, so this is the nerve wracking bit of the, the presentation because <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> What will happen? So, um, so let's, so, okay. Right. Well, quite a lot has happened. So, um, before I started, this is where we were before we started. This is my Slack channels. I'll just uh, expand that a bit. Okay. So it did find that Kilani, uh, name, which I was going to build the S3 bucket, uh, tomorrow, but you know, it's already been taken over. So let's, um, so that's, so let's have a look at that. So, um, if I just click on that, uh, that's the Kilani one. Um, so that has been taken over. Um, oh, that, sorry, that's the S3 bucket address, but it should work if I just do this. Yeah, Kilani.selador.io. So yeah, so that's been taken over by my friendly security account. Um, okay. So what else happened? Um, okay. So then the Elastic Beanstalk instance was detected. Um, the NS record was detected and that actually created a hacker one, um, uh, ticket as well. So the, the reason that we do that is, 
um, if we detect it and we then upload it to her bug, uh, bug crowd or hacker one as a known issue, then we can legitimately say, you know, when, when you, one of you three report it as on the platform, we can say, well, sorry, but it is a known issue. And, you know, that is then legitimate if our, our tool has detected it and uploaded it as a known issue to the platform before you, you find it. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, so, so it found out. Um, it also found out similarly that the EC2, the, so the, we deleted the EC2 instance. Um, and we found, and it, uh, uh, but we forgot to delete the record, so it identified that as well, that A record, which is good. Um, it then created, uh, did a friendly takeover of the Elastic Beanstalk instance as well. So um, here it is. Uh, so if we, yes, yeah, so that's Elastic Beanstalk. So um, yeah, so I think it, I think it found everything that we did, um, and. So that's good. <laughs> nice stuff a demo that works. Um, so, uh, so that's all good. So let's have a look at a few elements of that within the security tooling account. So previously I just showed you the uh, AWS account where all the Route 53 entries were. And I showed you the Cloudflare account as well. But now I've logged into the um, tooling account. So this is where we've actually installed, um, uh, yeah, we've, we've installed Domain Protect. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, um, we run step functions. So if I was to look at one of the step functions, you know, we could actually see a visualization of all the different accounts. So in this particular case, this is like a test org. It only has four accounts. In the real over energy case, we have several hundred. Um, but you can see if there's any issues, um, you know, there. So that's, uh, that's, that's good. Um, if we go to um, DynamoDB, we can have a look at the database um, uh, table if we want to. Uh, you know, so we have various items in the table of domains that have been vulnerable domains that have been detected and um, uh, and in some cases fixed. Um, and yeah, if we were to look at the, for example, at Elastic Beanstalk, bearing in mind we're now in the security account, you can see, you know, we've got this Elastic Beanstalk instance that's been created, which then produce the takeover. And similarly, that you'll, there'll also be an S3 bucket that's uh, created for the S3 takeover. So um, yeah, so that's uh, that's Domain Protect in action. Um, okay, so then returning to the presentation, um, what do we see as the next steps? Um, well, firstly, uh, some of the things that we want to do are increase the test coverage um, by, we, we do have tests, unit tests, integration tests, um, linting and so on, but we'd like to do more. Um, an A record uh, check for GCP would be very useful. We've got um, uh, because we have had some issues with GCP uh, a record takeovers. Um, we'd like to cover Azure DNS as well. Uh, that's another sort of area. Um, uh, and really anything else that we sort of get back, you know, as being wanted as a, you know, there's a business need for within the community. And you know, do really welcome collaborators. So we are starting to get a few more now, um, now that you know, we're uh, an OWASP project. Um, if you're interested, do come and talk to me. I'm around today and tomorrow. Just come and have a chat. Uh, longer term, uh, you can all get hold of me um, uh, various ways, which I'll just come on to. But also, uh, we do have a, a Slack channel in um, an OWASP Slack channel called Project Domain Protect. So you can also uh, use that. Um, so, um, yeah, do get in touch. If you want to get in touch directly with me, I'm on the OWASP Slack, um, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, just feel free to get in touch. Um, and I think that's it. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Paul. I think that was an amazing, amazing talk. At least for me, this, we had a lot of topics that I did not know anything about. So we'll take questions now. Does anyone have any questions? Yes, please. Uh, so uh, what was the trigger for it? I was one of the schedules, but I think that's the 
Um, it's run on the schedule. Yeah. So, uh, and, so, and, and you can vary the schedule. So, um, this particular implementation I've got running every 10 minutes um, because I wanted to make sure that during the time of the talk, it did actually, you know, find stuff. Um, that is variable through Terraform um, variables. But yeah, I think you want to keep it pretty short, uh, really. Uh, 10 minutes, 20 minutes, something like that. But if you start, if, it, if, it, if it's an hour or three hours, it, it, it's just too, too much, really. But because of the speed of the automation of some of the bug bounty researchers, um, yeah, because we've got to be faster than the bug bounty researchers. <laughs> That's the aim. <laughs> Can we not put it in the Yeah, so possibly. I mean, so I've had that question before. Um, and uh, it, it's, yeah, it, it's the sort of thing that sounds simple, but once you start thinking about it, it's quite complex because, so say with an overview example, we haven't got all our Route 53 um, entries, we haven't got all our Route 53 entries in a single account. We've got them spread over multiple accounts. Um, and then we, and in fact, it's, it's not so much about the so you'd sort of want to find out when is a resource deleted, but the corresponding root for three entry isn't, which is quite hard to ascertain. And sometimes we have cross-platform ones. So we have uh, uh, sometimes some records in AWS that point to GCP, and some that point to Azure. You know, and so uh, and then we've got Cloudflare um, records. So it it would be quite would be quite challenging. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the schedule seems fine. It's quite low cost. It's low cost to run because it's, uh, yeah, it's just, I say just, it's just like, well, it's just Lambda functions, um, really. You know, it's all, and, um, from a development point of view, it's all written in Python, uh, with the deployment, uh, by Terraform. So quite, quite s languages that are likely to be, well, Python will probably be familiar to a lot of people, Terraform to some people. Uh, but also if any of you are interested in collaborating, it is a, Great opportunity to, you know, develop skills in those languages, or maybe if you're familiar with Python, but you'd like to become more familiar with Terraform, for example, it's a, an opportunity. Um, yeah, no, good question. Any more questions? Okay. Yeah. Thank so, you. Thank you very much for this amazing talk. <laughs>